Good evening and welcome to the Washington State Department of Agriculture's avian influenza webinar. With news coming out of Russia this week about cases of avian influenza transmitting to humans, this is truly a timely topic. And by taking steps now, we can potentially prevent an outbreak of avian influenza in Washington. And we've had a, an amazing turnout. We've had almost 270 people register for the webinar, actually over 270 people register for tonight's webinar. I think this really demonstrates that our local poultry, poultry owners understand and take this disease really seriously. So we appreciate your attendance tonight. Tonight we'll be hearing from two speakers, Susan Kerr from WSCA and Laura Chen from Washington State University. But before we, we begin, we'll have a couple of technical reminders. First, as some of you probably already noticed, you won't be able to see the other attendees. So um, you'll only see yourself and the panelists and the host myself, Carla Selp. And speaking of which, I never did introduce myself. I'm sorry. My name is Carla Selp. I'm the public engagement special specialist with the Washington State Department of Agriculture. We will be taking questions tonight and we'll be using the question and answer function in WebEx. So if you have a question, feel free to pop that in there. We do ask that you um, don't send the question to just one panelist. We are all going to share the duties of responding to questions. So send your questions to everyone. If for some reason you're not able to access the Q&A function, we will be able to answer your questions um, after the webinar, you can always contact our avian health program at avhealth at agr.wa.gov. Also, we are recording this webinar and it will be posted on our YouTube channel later this week. We encourage you to share the link once it's posted so we can help spread the word even further about avian influenza and the steps that people can take to help protect their own flocks and their neighbors. Now we're ready to begin tonight's presentation. Dr. Kirk, please take it away. Okay, thanks very much, Carla. Good evening, everyone. I hope you've got your chicken chores done for the night and you can put your feet up and have a hot drink and learn a little bit about avian influenza. I bet a lot of you on the call have birds and you care about them. And even if you don't, I hope you do care about bird welfare. And I think that's the starting reason about why we should care about um, highly pathogenic avian influenza. It's the ultimate uh, form of bird welfare because we're if we prevent avian influenza, we're preventing that sickness and illness and suffering and death that goes along with it. And prevention obviously is preventing disease, is keeping birds healthy and, and preventing all that discomfort and, and suffering that they would go through with any kind of sickness. And uh, you might not know it, but Washington has a um, $168 million poultry industry. Some states have lots more. For the United States, the whole poultry industry, um, meat and eggs, is at, and birds themselves, is valued at $50 billion. We have a lot of international trade. And should we get avian influenza um, diagnosed here, identified here, some countries would shut down their trade, just like we have shut down trade with countries that are experiencing this disease right now. And also, we, if uh, bird health is affected and, and bird populations need to be depopulated on farms, we can see some effects on, on uh, meat and egg prices. And then we'll talk about this in more depth later, but avian influenza is a potential human health concern because of how this virus mutates. And again, we should care about high path, even if you don't own birds, because many people are employed in the industry. There would be environmental concerns of, of how we deal with all the dead birds. Supply chains would be disrupted through people that are trucking um, birds or grains or other products around. Uh, less sales, so less tax revenue for governments to operate. And many, many affiliated industries at high prices for consumers. So there's lots of reasons to care about high path, even influenza. As I mentioned, this is a potential human health concern, and this is just a little graphic to show kind of a public health person's worst nightmare about influenza. Uh, hopefully you can see my cursor there. Um, poultry, humans, and pigs all have a, an influenza type A virus that's uh, affiliated with their species. 
And unfortunately, uh, what happens with, with those influenza viruses is they're really happy to swap their genetics around with other strains of the same virus. So our real concern is that wild waterfowl, which can carry the low path avian influenza around uh, and transport it through uh, uh, between countries and, and just and contaminate water and so on with it, um, doesn't usually bother them. But they, through their droppings or direct contact, they can spread low path avian influenza to chickens. And then sometimes that virus will mutate into high path avian influenza. And a real nightmare is, is to have a, a bird and a person and a pig that are uh, clinically or subclinically affected with their species uh, influenza virus, having those all three in the same place. So then we get a virus that is easily spread between people, uh, easily, um, uh, um, let's see, what do I want to say? Easily contracted by people, spread between people, and deadly for people. So far, we've kind of had two out of the three. We've had some that were easy for people to catch uh, from uh, birds, but and and pretty deadly, but it just stopped with that person. And we've had other ones that were easy to catch, but not, not very deadly. And other ones that were hard to catch, but deadly, but nothing with all three. And that's our big concern. And so the takeaway message here is we want to keep these species separate. We want to have separation between wild, wild waterfowl and our domestic poultry. Um, we want to have separation between poultry and pigs. You might not think of that, but that's an important thing to do. So that is a concern with free ranging pigs or poultry overlapping. That's something to prevent. And then we want to have uh, contained or, or monitored contact, uh, restricted contact between people and chickens and people and pigs. That means folks, let's not be kissing your chickens and kissing your pigs. That is a real way to get uh, various diseases, not just avian influenza. Use biosecurity to keep that uh, protection between you and those species. So separate these species and stay away from poultry and pigs for that matter, if you're sick. Have somebody else do your chores for a while. This is uh, an example of weekly information we get from the World Animal Health Information Database. Here's the website if you're interested in more. Uh, we get this list of highly contagious diseases of concern that are active in the world every week. We get this on a Friday to make our weekend uh, a worry. And, and you, Noah, you can't see what's on there. It's because there's so many of them, but I'll just read some of them to you. African swine fever, uh, African horse sickness, rabies, highly pathogenic avian influenza, uh, Rift Valley fever. There's just a lot of bad diseases on there, but it tells us where they are, where they're active, and where they're circulating. And then this map is, uh, as of uh, this map was January 20th, I believe, of this year. The red dots are where avian influenza is currently happening. And the whoops, sorry, the blue is oops, the blue is where it was happening. And some of them have resolved. Now you can see they're uh, not in uh, the Western Hemisphere, they're all in the Eastern Hemisphere and in, in Africa and Europe and Asia. But birds don't know boundaries. And they have their flyways that they they migrate for um, overwintering and then back to uh, breeding grounds and so on. And these are all the different flyways, but look how they overlap. And so birds really can can contact each other, share diseases, spread diseases, even just on their feet. And here's our uh, Pacific flyway up and down the coasts here. But look how it overlaps with this red area. And that certainly goes into areas where we have active outbreaks. So we're with this Pacific flyway on the coast here, we are uh, in a prime position to have migrating waterfowl bring this disease in to our domestic poultry. Okay. PowerPoint uh, 10 days or so of, ago, and this was uh, accurate at the time. The current circulating virus does not affect human, but it is making some wild birds ill. And that we're actually not seeing the level of um, spread of high path avian influenza that we were predicting. And we think it's because the wild birds are sick and they're not moving around as much. Maybe it's going to be delayed and maybe it's not even going to happen. But 
as of a few days ago, Russia reported seven cases of infection in poultry plant workers. That doesn't mean they're ill. All the word we got was that there were seven cases of infection with this H5N8. And, and that just is even more of a reason to be concerned about this disease and do all we can to prevent its spread. Now let's talk about the virus a little bit. You can see in this picture down below there that looks uh, strangely familiar. It looks a little bit like a coronavirus because the avian influenza has little spikes coming off of it. And there's two different types. One is uh, there's 16 versions of one of the spikes. Um, it's a hemagglutin and protein spike. And then there's nine version of this neuraminidase spike. So there's lots of different permutations of H's and N's. And we're really worried about the H5s and the H7s because of the, those are the ones that tend to mutate from low path into high path in chickens. And those are the ones that tend to be able to get into humans. Low path just tells us doesn't cause as much sickness and high path is, is pretty deadly to our poultry. And mutation happens all the time. These are very uh, slippery viruses and that they, they change and mutate and evolve all the time. Our migratory birds, wild birds are natural reservoirs for the virus. They typically move it around. It doesn't bother them. They defecate the, the virus out in their feces and can contaminate envir environments with it and so on. And the subclinical types, especially in these wild birds can are the ones that make it into our backyard flocks and make those birds sick. Here are some signs of avian influenza. And, and Dr. Chen, if you want to um, jump in here and say anything additional, feel free. But um, re really, with high path avian influenza, here's our sign sudden death. It's a deadly disease. Low path has the birds have time to develop some of these uh, other signs, such as the sneezing and coughing and like in this bird, the swollen wattles and the discolored legs, it can still kill them, um, um, but it's not nearly as suddenly deadly. And, and again, with high path, that's the main thing we see is a really attentive bird will probably see, a uh, attentive owner would see birds probably a little depressed, a little bit off and, and not eating as much, but then dead. Uh, changes in egg production are a big one with low path. And even though it's not nearly as deadly, that's still going to affect people's economics, that bottom line there. Dr. Chen, anything you're going to want to say there about signs? No, you covered it well. Okay. And, and as poultry owners, please be aware of these signs. Uh, you know the signs of the run of the mill diseases in your flock, like coccidiosis or Merix or lice or so on. Um, Please contact your veterinarian or the avian health program if you see anything out of the ordinary or a lot of sick and dead birds. And this is a, a key point of tonight's um, presentation. A key message is promptly identifying and, and uh, recognizing illness and diagnosing it and containing it is critical to, to control the size of the outbreak. We want to just keep it to the initial farm. And, and then that way we're controlling animal suffering, we're minimizing that and the social disruption and all those economic ripple effects we're gonna see. So we really, really depend on that first owner to recognize it quickly and report it. And that means you see your birds, you know your birds, you look at them um, at least twice a day caring for them and, and you know what's normal and, and abnormal and, and take action if you see something abnormal. Here's a little bit of information about the 2014 and 15 outbreak we had in the country. This is pretty staggering. It was the largest and most expensive uh, animal health disaster in United States history. And look at this time frame. It was six months and over 50 million chickens and turkeys either died or were destroyed to contain the disease. We lost a whole lot of um, exports, uh, uh, $1.3 billion less in revenue and the consumer egg prices went up to the highest in 30 years. Government, a tremendous no amount of almost a billion dollars in expenses to control it. Uh, and people did receive indemnity. They got 100 for fair market value, but should that's not a limit, a lim an unlimited amount of money. And we need to contain these so we can uh, reimburse people for their losses um, and, and, and help everyone out that way. But the take home message is avian influenza outbreaks are expensive. They're expensive with the, the cost to contain them and to respond and, and control them and often and also in what products are lost. 
uh, let alone the, the, eight, the animal welfare concerns. We did have avian um, influenza, the high path kind in that outbreak in 2014-15. Uh, we had it in backyard flocks and one uh, falcon up in, in my neck of the woods here. Uh, they were, these flocks were depopulated to control the disease and those flocks were indemnified. But um, looking into these shows that biosecurity breaches played a large role in the outbreak. That just is another reminder is we have to always be deploying all of our biosecurity practices. Uh, sometimes we're telling people that even influenza is circulating, time to step up your biosecurity. I don't believe in that message. I think we should be doing all we can all the time, and then we can prevent um, these incursions at all. That's what I'm hoping is, is uh, it, it doesn't happen at all. Now, we talked about the 2014 uh, outbreak. We had one this year, last year that you might not have even heard about. It was a low path, even influenza outbreak in, um, in the border between North Carolina and South Carolina. It was identified through routine surveillance, which is terrific. And routine surveillance and a very, not, very knowledgeable owners. It was one introduction but then some secondary spread, and that's what comes from biosecurity lapses when it goes beyond the first farm. It was traced to a, a virus spread through the, the Mississippi flyway. And on these infected premises, there were uh, 361,000 um, birds depopulated to control it. And then one additional outbreak in South uh, Carolina was outside the surveillance zone. And here we have though, this is all low path. On April 6th, there were sick turkeys on one premise, uh, one farm in South Carolina. They had five barns and, and two days. So that's the day the birds were identified. We got the results back on the 8th. Four of those barns had a low path. One, though, barn had high path. It had mutated from the low path. And on that farm, all the commercial turkeys died or were euthanized. And I think this is pretty amazing. There were no additional cases after April 6th. Unlike that 2014 outbreak that went six months and and uh, it was over 50 million birds uh, euthanized or died and millions of dollars. This one was um, probably about a month for from start to finish at most and the quarantines were released in May. So I think that's, that's pretty uh, good testimony to knowledgeable bird, owner, bird owners and quick uh, stepping in of with government resources to contain and control it, because when you talk about poultry, uh, it doesn't get much more concentrated than North Carolina and South Carolina. Lots of birds there in a very valuable industry. Again, contained to one farm, thanks to routine surveillance, those knowledgeable owners who reported promptly and then swift containment. That was the key to controlling that outbreak. Well, we know avian influenza is always going around somewhere in the world. What are we doing proactively to monitor it? Uh, surveillance, like it's being done there, it's just an oral swab for my chicken. They they dislike the handling more than they care about the swab. Trust me, it, it, it looks a little invasive, but they're, they're much more upset by just being touched by a stranger. But we do swabbing of birds. Uh, at live bird markets throughout Washington every month, and this is throughout the United States. We just want to find that virus if it's here and find it quickly. We also collect eggs from backyard, um, uh, what do we call them? You know, like the farm fresh egg markets. We'll collect those and send them in to check for um, exposure to the virus. The birds are reflecting that. In Washington, we have 36 members of the National Poultry Improvement Program, and and we test them once a year for avian influenza and some of them voluntarily test themselves another time of year. We're certainly testing dead birds as they're uh, identified to us. Dr. Chen will talk more about that. Uh, we'll respond to sick bird calls when, and people are doing a good job of calling us about that. And we do need veterinarians to report and owners to report anything where there's many more sick birds or many more dead birds or unusual signs. And then the Department of Fish and Wildlife tests some uh, sick birds, sick waterfowl or dead waterfowl, or sometimes even just uh, birds submitted by hunters for surveillance too. They're very limited in 
and they're financing right now and they can't do as much as they'd like, but they are testing some birds, especially birds of concern. All right, what would the State Department of Ag do uh, as a response if there were an outbreak? Well, first we would uh, determine the nature of the outbreak and get a, a regulatory veterinarian to the farm within four hours and get a good, hate, a good history in case the samples and so on. And then we need to get it confirmed uh, that it yes and indeed indeed is even influenza or something else, and then we're going to uh, start this process of of notifying agencies involved in the response. We're going to quarantine the premise and restrict uh, movement of poultry products, and educate uh, poultry owners and do enhanced surveillance in that area. And then we need to control the disease. So that starts on the infected premise with humane bird depopulation and then reimbursing the owner for the value of those birds and composting or, or otherwise inactivating the virus in those carcasses. Then we have to clean the premises and disinfect it while we'll leave it some downtime. And then, and then the, the um, premise can be repopulated. That's the only good thing about this virus. It doesn't stick around a long time without its host. So we can, we don't have to burn the buildings down or, or or it's quarantined for life, we can restock that property. And then we really, really want to get everybody back in business uh, and, and have them resume either their small backyard business or their, their very large commercial business. Look at the value of the US export market value, um, just the export, that's not even domestic. And this is something I didn't know before. United States breeders supply 75% of the world's hatching eggs and chicks. So we need to get back in business and be able to get those birds out to other countries and so they can feed their people. This would be our investigation protocol. Look how it starts with you again. Poultry owners or the caretakers notice something wrong, either more birds dead or unusual signs of illness. They've got to call them to call your private veterinarian or call the state veterinarian line and, or the private veterinarian will contact us. And then that regulatory veterinarian will collect samples, submit for testing, and um, should there that be a confirmed case, we're going to stop movement and and uh, biosecurity should already already be happening, but we're going to have some additional control measures just to halt birds, halt the movement, and um, contain the disease. And the process again starts with observant and responsible owners. And what do I mean by responsible owner? I mean coming forward and saying, raising your hand and saying, uh, I've got a problem and I need some help. It doesn't do your birds or your neighbor's birds or our state's birds or the, the nation's birds any good for you to hide sick birds, for you to postpone asking for help. And the reason is it's gonna be, you'll lose your birds anyways, and it'll just be more birds lost in addition. I can't stress that enough is we do need that first person coming forward to say, I think it's on my farm. Uh, the tendency might be to, to just hide, hide your birds or not talk about it. We can't let that happen. And that actually did happen in China uh, back when the uh, bird flu was affecting people. The government was trying to contain that disease and depopulating and, and the Birds were people's lives and they brought them inside and hid them in their coats and they did everything to try to protect those birds. And with that close contact between the sick birds and people, that's when the people got the disease too. So I can't stress this enough. Please just let us know if you have a concern and we just need to control it as quickly as we can and keep the outbreak as small as we can. Here's just a, a map of of a kind of a diagram of what happens if we do have a disease outbreak of concern. And this could be foot and mouth disease or African swine fever or even influenza. We have the infected premise, the original farm, where we've got positive birds um, diagnosed. And that's going to be depopulation. That's going to be control of that disease by removing the host, which is poultry. And they'll be humanely depopulated. Then there's a, a uh, radius set up around there, kind of disease we're talking about, but there's monitoring of those animals, surveillance. Uh, animals aren't allowed to move or products aren't allowed to move. And then around there, we have these buffer zones and surveillance zones and so on. And depending on the disease, we might vaccinate a circle around here 
or um, again, stop movement. And, and in some diseases that are uh, very, very contagious, the depopulation might even need to be wider than just that initial farm. It all depends on the disease. Uh, but the, the point of this is just to contain that outbreak and control it to minimize the damage from that outbreak. And a, a, again, this is a, a major a point of tonight is to please be responsible and and come forward if you see something. Uh, you're doing the right thing for your birds and everybody else's birds, and and um, it's never anyone's um, uh, desire to be first. But should avian influenza hit here, it's going to be somewhere first, and you'll be a real a real hero if you step forward and let us know quickly. The um, some of you might be familiar with the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus outbreak that we had starting last, no, two years ago, July 2019. And the very first person to notice that was a 4-H uh, rabbit owner. And that was very impressive for that youth to seek veterinary help for their sick rabbit and, and for us to know as quickly as we could that there was this horrible disease of rabbits so that we could then educate people about it and reduce losses. For any disease, there's three factors that work together. One is the disease agent itself. The other is environmental factors and the other one is host factors. And when things are just right, we get disease. Our job as people interested in animal health is to do what we can to increase the resistance of our hosts to reduce the environmental factors that are promoting disease and then reduce reduce exposure to that pathogen. So let's see what we can do for each of these. But as we increase bird resistance, the factors we can do are, this is the foundation, is proper nutrition. Birds need their proper quantity and quality of food and water. And this means each bird, uh, some of them are more timid as you know, and you need to be a um, effective manager and make sure each bird gets the food and water it needs. And just realize that commercial diets are, are scientifically designed to meet the bird's needs. Birds are monogastrics like we are. They have uh, essential amino acid requirements. And if you're making a homemade diet, you might not be giving your birds all the nutrients they need. Not that you can't make a balanced diet yourself. You just have to realize there are specific nutrients you're going to have to add to the diet that you're, you're going to have to go out of your way to get. Um, we need to monitor the weight and the condition of our birds and make sure we're um, giving them an appropriate diet and feed them properly for what they're doing. Are they a growing bird? Are they a laying bird? Or, or, or what, what are they doing? And don't feed your birds on the ground. That'll help prevent some diseases to try to keep them as clean as possible. Work with your veterinarian to discuss any kind of illnesses you're concerned about and how to treat properly. And um, vaccination is a great way to prevent disease, uh, diseases of concern when vaccines are available, and then minimize birds. And how do we do that? Um, you know your birds and you know what they like. They Most animals like routine. They like the same food, the same people, the same environment, and that keeps their stress level low. Uh, same noises, same smells, and so on. And, and controlling predators also reduces risk and stress. How do we uh, reduce environmental factors that contribute to disease? Well, we need really good air quality, and that means air should smell fresh at all levels of whatever housing you have birds in when they're housed. Uh, stand up and breathe, and then and then get way down on your knees and breathe, and and hopefully you've got good air quality, no dust, and no ammonia smell. Because if you can smell it, they can smell it, and it's very caustic to their respiratory tissues. Try to protect birds <laughs> from flooding and wetness. Good luck in here in Western Washington, but give them the option of getting away from that flooding and wetness and getting to dry areas. Uh, good luck with ducks, but they, you know, they, they're more adapted to that. Of course, uh, anything you can do to keep the area uh, more sanitary by mud control and uh, controlling feces, keeping clean and dry bedding down there. That really helps uh, decrease the exposure to pathogens. Um, and, and the proper temperatures for bird comfort are very important for chicks, of course, and it's important in the summer that we provide shade that the birds don't overheat. And you can see the other factors there. We don't want to overcrowd our birds. Definitely want to control flies and rats and so on because they can mer merge or move 
pathogens around. And then here's a big one for avian influenza. We want to prevent that contact between wildlife and wild birds and their habitat and our poultry. And you can see that uh, that domestic goose there in the water. What if uh, wild ducks had just been there and had defecated and now there's avian influenza virus in that water? That bird or that duck could easily goose could easily pick that up. And uh, the domestic uh, chickens and turkeys and ducks and geese are the ones at most risk of avian influenza. How do we reduce pathogen factors? Well, a big one is to keep your flock closed. And what does that mean? Well, it means any expansion of your flock is all internal growth. You're hatching your own birds. Uh, you're not bringing new birds in. You're not going to shows. Just lost a lot of the audience. You're not going to shows um, because the, the biggest way to um, put your bird's health at risk is to um, bring a new bird into your flock. I know some of you need to do that periodically for genetic reasons, um, but if you do that, it's so important that you get them from a um, an MPIP source and good reputation with that owner and you quarantine them and monitor their health for at least 30 days. Got to keep them separate. Just don't bring them home and plunk them down with your other birds. It's best to separate birds by age because the older birds could easily be carrying diseases and, sh and they're happy with those diseases. They've adapted to them. And uh, but they can be shedding viruses or bacteria to younger birds, and uh, we want to uh, reduce that risk by separating birds by age. And and uh, do what we can to have the birds be as old as they can, and uh, when they meet a disease for the first time, they meet a disease agent for the first time, and they don't meet an overwhelming amount of it. And that's helpful to have them gain a little immunity, but not be overwhelmed. Try to get sunlight into your facilities and on your equipment and so on. Uh, that's really good at, at drying things out and killing pathogens. And, and as we mentioned before, separate your species to um, prevent contact um, between sick birds and sick humans. And we're going to talk more about cleaning and disinfection because uh, that will really help keep down the number of pathogen, pathogens. Here is another major message for tonight that you can't disinfect something if you don't clean it first. And what does that mean? That means we're going to thoroughly clean. First, you're going to dry clean all the manure and mud and debris and pebbles and everything that's on your boots. That's kind of a dry cleaning process. Then thoroughly clean with soap and water so that when you're done, you see no organic debris at all. You see no mud. It's not mostly gone. It's all gone. You might, I have to scratch, um, do my boots with a toothbrush to get them clean. And that's what I do. And, and because what if I moved a virus around from one um, bird market to another? It'd be horrible, horrible. And so I, you have to clean till it's all visibly gone. And then um, you rinse well and let it dry if you've got time. But what you do next is, this is critical, apply an appropriate disinfectant. And it's one that's going to be effective against the diseases you're trying to um, prevent. And it's you have to use the right concentration for the right contact time. And that contact time is often 10 minutes. So just tromping through a foot bath, step, step, you're done. That is a um, false sense of security. I would rather have you not use a foot bath than, than think it's working like that. You need sometimes 10 minutes of contact for that disinfectant to be effective. And then we want to rinse and get the product off of there and let it dry before we use those that equipment again or those tools or so on. And, and again, really, really important for you to realize you can't disinfect something without the soap and water first. This site that's mentioned down here is just a terrific one for uh, infection and disease control resources. That's where this came from. This is a nice poster to print off if you can. It's the Center for Food Safety and Public Health at Iowa State, and it's in our resources at the end. A little uh, summary of the steps of biosecurity are listed here, and, and the word is, is an active word. Biosecurity is the actions we take to reduce the risk of introduction and spread of diseases on a farm. 
and we want to prevent diseases instead of treat them. We want a boring, boring farm where we're not running around with all these treatments and doing fire engine stuff. We want a nice, boring farm where the animals are healthy and we just have regular chores every day, not not uh, life saving measures to keep animals alive. What are the benefits? Well, uh, biosecurity, we're going to keep pathogens off the farm. We're going to keep our animals healthier. We're going to decrease our costs in the use of medications. We're going to have a reputation for having a um, healthy flock. And then we're going to, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're going to address animal welfare by keeping our animals healthy and just preventing all that suffering in the first place. And how do you implement biosecurity on your farm? Work with your veterinarian. It's what we have the training for. We can adapt things to your farm and work with you to develop a best practices plan. And, um, and working with your veterinarian is proactive and it will prevent disease and it's cost effective in the long run. You've got to, uh, to stay within the law and use some medications. You've got to have this veterinary client relationship, which is a, a legally defined relationship. Uh, where this veterinarian knows you, knows your premises, knows your animals, and can make recommendations to you about legal use of medications on your farm. A little checklist here for biosecurity. We've talked about most of these things. Um, we didn't talk about this though. Remove dead birds and isolate sick birds immediately. And just make a decision about whether you're going to treat that bird or you're going to euthanize it and try to make that decision quickly. I, I seems like the most of the bird owners I talk to when they have a sick bird, they, they dispatch it. They don't treat it. They euthanize it for the sake of their flock. And very important for you to know the signs of illness of the various diseases. We talked about all this. Oh, do what you can to protect to uh, keep your feed and water clean. Keep uh, cats from defecating in the grain and keep uh, rats out of the water and all of that. Just keep it as clean as you can. Wash your hands before you handle the birds and for your health after you handle the birds and between any groups of birds that you might have. And we talked about those other things. We'll move on. Again, as I mentioned, deal with sick birds by isolating them immediately. And if it's something unfamiliar to you, discuss the signs of the illness with your veterinarian. And it's really important for you to keep good records. Uh, it could be that you find that, gosh, all the birds I got from this source get sick a lot and they need they need treatment a lot and the other birds from the other place I got them stay healthy. Keep that kind of information. Uh, keep information on if you're selling birds, how do your birds do at other pl people's places? What kind of problems that they had with them? And if you are treating, what is the response to the treatment that, that you're seeing? If you do have some sick birds, uh, do your healthy animal chores first and then treat your sick birds or designate just one person for the sick birds. And also uh, really important for you to, to quarantine any new birds, as I mentioned. Quarantine means isolation of healthy animals that you're just gonna watch. And isolation means a hospital, like a hospital area, isolating sick birds. And have separate equipment for that isolation area. All the feeding equipment, all the cages, anything there should be specific to that isolated bird area. Here's the results from a poll that was taken of livestock and poultry owners back in 2012, the question was, do you have a quarantine area for new animals or ones that are returning from, say they're being bred or they're returning from a show or something? Less than half of the people quarantined animals and 11% sometimes did, 48%, about half never did. So they would buy something or something would come back to the farm, plunk it right in with their, their home flock. Of these people that didn't do that, these are the reasons they said for not having a quarantine facility. Um, they don't have an area for that. And another one is a big one here is they trust the source of where they're getting their animals. Well, that's lovely, but can you see viruses and can you see bacteria? No, we can't. And it's nice that you trust them, uh, but trust only uh, goes so far and we can't test trust in the laboratory. We need to have more facts than that. And also, um, just the stress of moving to a new place can make these apparently healthy birds um, come down with something clinical. Uh, another other reasons were they don't have enough time. 
And that one is a concern to me because I think when we're talking about caring for animals, you have to stay within your resources. Resources means time and space and, and money, really. And if you don't have the time to care for things properly, you either have too many of them, or um, maybe we should be looking at something else instead, like goldfish or something, if you want to have some pets. Need the time they deserve and they require to stay healthy. Quarantine time is 30 days for newer returning animals, and you have to monitor them every day. If after 30 days they haven't broken with something, they probably are good to go, and we can carefully um, put them in with our other animals, uh, watching them, of course, for negative social interactions. What do you do if you have sick birds? Well, if you just have one or two, uh, contact your veterinarian if it's just typical losses and so on. But if you have unusual signs of illness or a lot of new, a lot of sick birds or a lot of dead birds, call our, uh, uh, you can call our sick bird hotline. The number's there. You can call Dr. Dobbs or email um, the avian health um, program, which is listed there. Please, please, please educate yourself and keep in the loop on diseases about what's happening where. You can, um, so I really strongly encourage you to subscribe and get on our listserv, and then you'll get notification quickly of issues and concerns. Uh, join poultry associations in your area, and there are some very valuable chat groups sharing factual information. Really, I really encourage you to jump off the ones that are uh, rumor mongers or, or just trying to scare people. Stick with the facts, stick with the people that obviously uh, Take the time to get educated on, on what reality is in your area. And this is how we value information by is it current? Uh, how relevant is it to, to what you need? What's the source of the info? Is it uh, reliable and accurate? And does it mesh with other things you've heard from other sources? And what is the purpose of the information? We want it to be to educate people and move them to appropriate action, not just to cause more drama. And please don't add to the drama either. Just share facts with each other. This is, I think, a, 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 one of the major messages of tonight is it's really important for us to make all these biosecurity practices routine because we never know where this next virus or bacteria of concern will come from. It's got to start on somebody's farm first. And if you're always practicing good biosecurity, you've kind of turned away this pathogen at the door. It's got to find somebody someplace else to go. It's not going to be at your part, at your place. And you're, you can think of biosecurity as the health seatbelt for your birds because you've prevented this disease from coming on the property by your practices. Here are a lot of good resources. Um, if you if you go to the bird flu page uh, on our um, Department of Ag website, there's just a lot of good resources there. Obviously, USDA has a very strong avian health program, uh, and Waddle does as well, Dr. Chen's lab, and we've got uh, lots of other ones. You'll notice these are all, um, these are .govs, .orgs, and .edus. Not to say that there aren't good .com sites out there, but any of them are of concern, and they've got, they want to sell you things, so you have to be careful with those resources. Um, feel free to put any questions for me in the chat box, but now we've got uh, Dr. Chen's presentation. Um, Dr. Kerr, we do have a couple questions in the chat that are directed to you, so we'll go ahead and um, ask them now if that's okay. Sure. Okay, so there is one question from Dennis, and he asked, is avian flu carried by birds other than waterfowl? Dr. Chen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think with the other birds, we mostly care about them physically or mechanically moving around on their feathers and their feet. It doesn't so much replicate and be shed by them. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so in terms of the natural reservoirs for avian influenza among birds, it's definitely waterfowl and then as well shradriforms, which are shorebirds, so um, birds like ox, terns, and gulls. Um, and so those are the natural reservoirs that are more likely to carry it asymptomatically and spread it. Um, the second question from Alex was, are small, oh, do smaller flocks have a lower chance of getting the virus? <laughs> that is an excellent question. 
And it's all about exposure and, and preventative practices. They, they have a high risk if they're exposed to or overlap with wild waterfowl and you're practicing no biosecurity whatsoever. But if you're providing them, I mean, it's lowest risk to keep birds inside. I know a lot of people don't like that thought, but it's reducing the exposure to a lot of pathogens. If you keep your small flock indoors and you feed them well and you're washing your hands and, and using protective clothing and changing your shoes, um, they're, they're at very low risk. But if you have them outside just wandering around free and they're often cold and wet and not fed well, and there are a lot of wild birds that can fly in and fly out, then they're at as, they're at as much risk as they can be, just about. So it's not really so much dependent on size as it is environment in that case. Yep, totally agree with that. Alex, I think uh, one thing to add is potentially when you think of larger flocks, if there's an organization that has multiple facilities, potentially if a person is going from flock to flock to flock without appropriate biosecurity, that risk would certainly be higher. But inherently with size, I think Dr. Kerr addressed all of the relevant points. And remember, too, in that 2014 outbreak, that was backyard flocks. Exactly. Um, Wendy had a question uh, unrelated, just generally, will this material be available for download? Um, Carla, please correct me if I'm wrong, but we are recording this presentation and it should be available to you. That's correct. We will be posting it on YouTube probably tomorrow. And also, we're going to make this PowerPoint into a PDF we can uh, disseminate to people if they're interested. Yes, we can post that on the agr.wa.gov slash bird flu website. So that'll be easy for people to access and download if they want the you know printed slides. Um, so I'll go ahead and chat a little bit about uh, my lab, the Avian Health and Food Safety Lab. Before diving into it, just wanted to um, mention, I don't know if Dr. Dobbs has had a chance to speak yet, but she is on the list of panelists. So if you guys have any questions whatsoever, Dr. Dobbs, Dr. Kara, myself, we are more than happy to chime in. And Dr. Dobbs certainly is a great resource as the Avian Health Lead for WSDA. And one of my favorite parts of my position is being able to work with her. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> so, I'm going to talk a little bit about my lab. Uh, just briefly, the Avian Health and Food Safety Laboratory is an AAVLD accredited laboratory and is a branch lab of the Washington Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab. So, if you guys have other animal species, you may have worked with WADL, is the abbreviation, out in Pullman, Washington. We're actually located on the west side of the state in Puyallup, Washington, about 45 minutes south of Seattle. And I've included the phone number and our email address on this PowerPoint. I'll also type it into the chat at the end just in case we move past this too quickly. Um, the picture on the left side of the screen is clearly not from today because it was quite rainy on the west side of the state. Um, it's helping me dream of sunnier, warmer days. And our facility is uh, just below Mount Rainier, kind of tiny in that picture, but is a fun place to work. Um, and what we do, a couple of different things that Waddle as a whole, as well as the Avian Health and Food Safety Lab does. First and foremost, we provide accurate, state-of-the-art, timely, and cost-effective diagnostic services. But as well, we have a ton of really wonderful subject matter experts that are willing to answer questions. Um, and then kind of all together as a part of that, we facilitate disease surveillance and outreach. Um, overall, this results in us being able to help safeguard animal health, food supply, and of course, public health. And Dr. Kerr touched on all of those things and how they're related to avian influenza today. Um, as Dr. Kerr mentioned, we do always recommend working with a clinical veterinarian because they're able to establish an appropriate veterinary client patient relationship with you and make um, valid recommendations. Um, but we do also so accept owner submissions if needed. Uh, just briefly want to touch on the different types of avian influenza testing that we offer at HFSL, and some of these tests are also available at Waddle Pullman. <coughs> I feel like a lot of folks are potentially aware of what these terms mean nowadays because we hear a lot of them associated with COVID-19, but we'll touch on that briefly. Um, the first test that I'm going to mention is serology testing. And the principle for that test is that it looks for the presence of antibodies produced by the immune system in this case, specifically in response to avian influenza infection. 
Serology is a really great tool to use for overall flock health surveillance, um, but not necessarily the best test to perform in the face of an acute disease outbreak. In terms of the appropriate sample for serology, clotted whole blood or separated serum is a great sample. Um, if folks are comfortable drawing blood, uh, that is potentially one avenue, but we always do recommend reaching out to your veterinarian and helping you with the process because they are much more comfortable probably with drawing blood um, and again can uh, interpret results for you. A couple pros related to serology, it is quite affordable at AHFSL and at Waddle. It's only $5 a sample for avian influenza serology. There are a couple cons though. Uh, sample collection, as I mentioned, can be difficult and it's best performed by a veterinary health professional. And then as well, you can have false negatives in the face of acute infections, which is why you don't necessarily um, maybe want to choose this test in the face of true disease. And that false negative is more so because the body just has not yet had the time to respond. Um, the other test that is available is RT-PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. We've probably heard that talked about in the news related to COVID-19. The principle for that test is evaluating for the presence of viral genomic material, which in this case is RNA. Uh, sample is a little bit easier to collect compared to collecting blood. It is a swab of the coenal cleft and then put into transport media. Um, the picture on the right side of the screen is showing the coenal cleft of a bird. Um, this bird has passed away. That does look like a very uncomfortable position. And that cleft just in the roof of the mouth is where that swab would be inserted. In terms of pros related to RT-PCR, it's sensitive for active infections. Um, cons, it is a little bit pricier. It's about $50 per sample. And as well, if you're testing way after the fact a disease outbreak has occurred, you might not detect the virus. And of course, Dr. Kerr did a really good job talking about avian influenza today. What are the symptoms? How can we prevent it? Unfortunately, disease happens, but we're here to help. And uh, we're here to help not just related to avian influenza, but other health conditions. Of course, we do recommend reaching out to your veterinarian, um, but we do have tests available to figure it out if a bird has passed away. Um, the image on the left side of the screen is kind of the bottom half of our submission form. So it just shows briefly the different tests we have available. And Dr. Kerr, if you could click forward. <coughs> Uh, sorry, a small blue circle popped up that was circling our necropsy test. Uh, sometimes the best option is to do an autopsy or a necropsy. Uh, it's a great specimen to have on hand and it can help us figure out what's going on, whether it's related to an infectious disease process or potentially something feed or husbandry related. Um, and that picture on the right side of the screen is just to show one of the common conditions that we see among backyard poultry. Um, this bird is lying on its back and it has had its keel bone removed and then flipped uh, up towards its head. And so what we're looking at is all the visceral organs. Towards the top, you can see the heart. And then more towards the bottom, what we're seeing is a lot of evidence of acute inflammation, primarily centered along the reproductive tract. And so this is consistent with a bacterial infection in the reproductive tract, which unfortunately is quite common. Um, and of course, that is just a little brief snippet of what we do at the lab and about avian influenza. But if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to visit our website or give us a call. And um, that's our screenshot of our website on the right side of the screen. Um, and we're here to help. So if you need anything, just let us know. Thanks, Laura. And it looks like we've had quite a few questions come in. I'll let you take a look through those quickly. Um, and Dr. Dobbs, did you want to um, share anything before we go through the questions? I'll unmute your line. Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Dobbs. I'm the avian health lead for Washington State Department of Agriculture. And as Dr. Chen said, I do work a lot with her on avian cases and diseases that crop up. Um, so Excellent job, Dr. Kerr, on that overview. I, th I think that's wonderful. One of my main jobs is I also uh, help with the National Poultry Improvement Plan certifications for the flocks that are interested in that. And so I communicate a lot with the backyard flocks that way. Uh, one thing I just did want to clarify, though, um, we don't have any live bird 
uh, markets here in Washington state, but we do have auctions and we go to those um, live bird markets are, are where someone goes and picks a bird and has it slaughtered on site. And those are common in such uh, various other states like California and others. But uh, one of the main concerns about the, the, uh, the live bird markets is, is, is a, a circulating H2N2, which is not a reportable H5, H7 avian disease, but it's out there and there is some concern of it eventually mutating and and causing harm to poultry and even perhaps people. So that's that's a challenge we also face. And also with this news about the uh, H5N8 uh, popping up in Russia and affecting seven poultry workers, that is kind of concerning. Uh, even though the poultry workers were only mildly affected uh, and there's no people to people transmission, we do worry about this zoonotic transmission from the chickens to the people. And all the more reason to be vigilant on your flocks, because again, you're one of the first lines of defense out there. If you see all of a sudden birds are dropping dead, uh, birds that you might see dropping before even your chickens might be guinea fowl or peacocks. Uh, tend to really be susceptible. If you see that happening, that's uh, we need a call on that one. Um, but again, you're our first line of defense, so please report anything unusual, uh, not just you know one or two birds that might have had coccidia or something else, but something that's really really unusual. The uh, with the the symptoms that Dr. Kerr described earlier. And I, uh, oh, and one more note about the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the surveillance. The common question that keeps coming up is, is there going to be increased surveillance for avian influenza in the Pacific Flyway during this possible looming threat of uh, avian influenza coming our way? Um, due to funding, they're not currently able to do that. They have done some in Alaska, where it's kind of a mixing pot for some of these flyways, and a, a hot spot in Idaho. Um, but the good news is I think they are going to start looking a little more at the Pacific Northwest, depending on funding, possibly this year. Uh, what that looks like exactly yet, I don't know. But right now, most of the surveillance is going on in the East Coast. So everybody's looking. There's no reason to panic or anything like that. The purpose of this webinar is awareness and having everybody practice their good biosecurity standards and uh, just just being being ready and, and, and working together. This is gonna be a One Health collaborative event for sure, if it does come here, but I think if we can prevent it, that's the best. Anyway, um, that's really all I have to say, other than I'm I'm so pleased and proud that everybody has tuned into this and, and a wonderful job by, by Dr. Kerr and Dr. Chen, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dobbs. Um, Laurie, you did a great job of going through the questions before. Do you want to take us through the ones that have not been answered yet? Yeah, I'd be more than happy to. Um, and I'll just read these out loud to the panelists. Anyone can chime in um, who feels ready to answer. Uh, this question is from Kaylin. Can backyard ducks like pecans who live in an aviary contract avian influenza and become ill from it? And what would the signs be? Um, I'd be happy to answer that, Kaylin, and then Dr. Dobbs or Dr. Kerr, if you want to chime in. Um, so certainly Pekin ducks, they would be classified as a natural reservoir because they are in that waterfowl family, definitely can contract avian influenza. Generally speaking, the high pathogenicity avian influenza strains that cause more significant morbidity and mortality affect galliform birds. So birds such as uh, chickens, turkeys, or the game birds, that game birds mentioned previously. Uh, but there are definitely reports of waterfowl becoming very ill, and those would be similar to those previously mentioned by Dr. Kerr. Um, Dr. Kerr, anything to add on that? Actually, when we, this is Dana, uh, when we responded to the 2014-2015 outbreak, there were a significant amount of waterfowl on one of the prems, and yes, they get limp, they they have difficulty breathing, they they, they fall, uh, they, they just look very sick, and it's very similar to the chickens from what I saw. Great, thank you. Um, this question is from Kate. 
How communicable is the avian flu generally? If one bird in a flock gets this, what are the chances the rest don't have it? Uh, the chances are not very good that they don't have it. The, the avian influenza for domestic poultry is very contagious. Odds are if one has it, it's throughout the whole flock. And you're generally not going to just see it in one bird. Uh, it, it might start in one bird, but but again, like Dr. Kerr says, it's going to spread quick. If you've got only one or two sick birds and something else is probably going on. That's a really good time to contact your, your veterinarian or uh, perhaps submit a bird to the Avian Health Lab for, for necropsy. Good point. And this next question is from Teresa. Does this virus affect the eggs of laying hens? The, the low path avian influenza does. You might see irregular shaped eggs or a decrease in egg production. And that's one of the main things that big commercial houses see is they see a, a drop off in the, num in the amount of production. Uh, but that's low path. Remember the main sign of high path is death. All right, great. Um, someone asked, where can I find avian veterinarians? Um, I'll answer for the west side of the state. There are quite a few veterinarians that do see poultry species. Um, sometimes it's not always obvious, but I think if you just call and ask. They'll make it pretty clear whether they feel comfortable seeing poultry or birds in general. Are there also like WSVMA directories or anything of that sort where they might be able to go? Uh, this question does come up a lot and unfortunately, we at WSDA can't recommend specific veterinarians, but uh, there's got to be a place where people can go to maybe search in their areas for someone that might be willing to see sick birds rather than just calling around. And sometimes you might have to just call around, but it seems like there should be a way to find out that information. Does anybody know? I think the AVMA may have a resource like you're talking about, um, Dr. Dobbs. I have not checked recently though. This is Carla and um, just on a like, kind of social media side, there are quite a few um, like poultry Facebook groups. So if you were to post in one of those locally, they might be able to provide you um, some resources for veterinarians that work with birds. That's not an ideal <laughs> situation, but it's a one option. Um, Jeff had a question related to a previous question. Can these diseases be transmitted through eggs? Um, I definitely have investigated before whether uh, high pathogenicity avian influenza can be transmitted through eggs. Uh, certainly the virus can be detected in the reproductive tract. In terms of actual transmission, most likely those eggs would die, uh, the young that would be coming from those eggs would die rather than uh, having some sort of true vertical transmission. Dr. Kerr, Dr. Dodge, do you have anything to add to that one? No, I don't. Thank you. And Katie, I think that, I'm oh, sorry. I'm saying I'm busy trying to put the URLs for the resources in the oh. chat. Thank you for doing that. Um, Katie, you asked a couple questions about that, and I think that should answer it um, as well. Carla, I don't know if you see there's a couple questions related to uh, the recording and YouTube channel. Uh, since we've answered those previously, I think it'd be okay to respond directly in the chat box. Um, there's there's one that I, I didn't, I don't think I answered, and it said when, and it's from Rachel and it says when submitting a bird for necropsy, does the producer have to, oops, it just disappeared. <laughs> does the producer have to deliver the bird? And it, I don't know, it just went off my screen. Yeah, uh, no, Rachel, I see that question <coughs> um, from you. Uh, no, you do not have to hand deliver that bird. We will accept specimens delivered um, 
through a carrier um, and we have instructions on our website on how to do it because there's some pretty clear specifications. So check that out. I will uh, eventually type the link to our website in the chat. Um, keep going uh, for folks that inquired about avian veterinarians. A couple people have posted some resources there. So definitely take a look. Uh, there was a question can from Teresa, can the eggs make people sick? Oh, sorry. And Cheryl, I just saw your comment. I'll go ahead and um, try and make the resources that I just mentioned available to everyone. I think the easiest is, will be if we just make sure the resources are posted at agr.wa.gov slash bird flu. Um, so I'm not sure if everybody's able to see all of the questions and responses. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you, Carla. Um, okay. Sorry, Teresa, to get back to your question, uh, Dr. Care, Dr. Dobbs, do you have anything to add to that or respond to that question with? I think we're more concerned about salmonella um, being spread through eggs and anything else. So cook properly and, and you won't have a risk from salmonella or the avian influenza virus. So pretty easy disease to prevent by proper cooking. Um, Rachel asked, forgive me if this, is, sorry, I won't read that part. Uh, should home hatch chicks be vaccinated? Um, that's a really good question. Dr. Care, Dr. Dobbs, do you have anything you want to chime in about for this one? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that question. Sorry, uh, the question was, should home hatch chicks be vaccinated? Do you, do you mean for avian influenza or for other diseases? Because we, we're not, vaccinating for avian influenza, but you can vaccinate for Merix and exidiosis and there, there are many, many oh, diseases in general. Okay, that's that's something to talk to your veterinarian about because there are lots of potential vaccines for birds, but you'll go broke if you give them all to your mm -hmm. bird. So we wanna just reduce the diseases of concern for your flock and that's something to talk to your veterinarian about, but. Uh, Merix and Coxidia are two to think about. Yeah, um, Rachel clarified Dr. Kara diseases in general. Um, totally agree with what Dr. Kara said, Rachel. It just depends on the disease pressure on your property in your area. Um, the disease I see vaccinations against most frequently is Merix disease. Um, and that is administered either in OVO, so when the eggs are incubating or at one day of age. So definitely something that you want to do young and think about young. Uh, coccidia vaccine can be appropriate in certain scenarios, can be a tricky one to manage because uh, to some extent vaccination is a misnomer. That's a whole other conversation. Um, all right. And we, we do have brochures that we can uh, Post or move to the bird flu site, maybe call up, uh, that you can um, print out and then hand to people. So um, that's for Elizabeth. And we have some biosecurity pamphlets as well. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ken. Are there any other questions? Yes, we had one come in from Tina. When quarantining new birds in the farm, what's the recommended distance? Between quarantine and the home birds. What do you think, Dr. Chen? Is it 30 feet? I know for a lot of livestock diseases, we say 10 feet because it needs they need direct contact, but some of these uh, uh, diseases, we probably need more distance than that, don't you think? I say as far as reasonable. <laughs> um, as, as far as is reasonable on your property, because Dr. Kerr, you're totally right. Um, I think from my perspective, the disease of greatest concern that I could see transmitting over a longer distance than 10 feet certainly would be Merrick's disease. Um, and so that is transmitted in feather dander. And as you can imagine, feather dander is quite light, quite fluffy. It can be uh, blown around easily. So as far as it's reasonable for you, and then what Dr. Kara talked about earlier about making sure you have appropriate um, uh, 
uh, biosecurity. So even among your birds that are in quarantine and your other birds that have already been on your property. So washing your hands, washing your boots, having a separate set of clothing, if at all possible, handling your um, healthy birds first. So I would classify the birds that were already on your property as the healthy, clean birds, and then the quarantining birds later. And also, if you can situate the clean birds um, downwind of the um, home flock, that would be best too. You don't want the dander or other pathogens going uh, downwind from the quarantined and, and more at risk birds than your home flock. Think about airflow and and if you're talking about ducks, think about water flow as far as where you're situating the new birds and the home birds. Good point. Cheryl had a great question. It seems like a lot of the symptoms for poultry mimic other diseases. Is there one defining symptom avian influenza for avian influenza we can identify more easily? Um, for highly high pathogenicity avian influenza, I think the short answer is Probably not. Um, certainly, some of the vascular changes associated with HPAI may be a little bit more defining, but we can certainly see that in other conditions. And it makes it so tricky. The other thing with chickens that I've noticed is that they're super good at hiding their symptoms until they're quite ill. And then at that point, a lot of the symptoms can overlap. And so that's why there are resources such as WSDA's um, hotline and as well uh, diagnostic labs. And I don't know that there's another disease of birds that causes such high rates of sickness and death, though, would you say, Dr. Chen? That's a really good point. At the flock level, um, when we're talking about percent mortality, I think Newcastle disease uh, would certainly also be a consideration. But when there's high mortality at that flock level, maybe you would be more concerned about um, either high, highly pathogenic avian influenza or virulent Newcastle disease. Yeah, that was exactly the point I was going to jump in on. And, and because many of these diseases look so similar at first, that's the importance of early diagnostics and notification so that we can figure out exactly what we're dealing with. Because um, we can't just look at that bird and say, oh, that's avian influenza, because it could be something very similar. Um, so it, it really underscores the importance of being vigilant and, and getting those birds tested or submitted. Katie had. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was going to move on. Okay. 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 Katie had a really good question. Are there plans for a vaccination webinar or info on Merix, coccidiosis, and salmonella symptoms? Not by this group, but we do things based on need. So if you think there's a need for one, we can, we can make that happen. Would people be interested in more outreach? Because we could work with. There's things that WSDA governs and regulates and is involved with, and things that Extension can do more general outreach. So we could always partner with Extension again, but Extension take the lead. We have some yeses and yeses. Yes, I think there is a resounding yes response. Okay. Uh, why don't you, and feel free to email that avian influenza health email about the topics you're interested in. And I think we left a message up, up unanswered up above. Um, oh, clothing between farms. I think it was. I, I think I remember and it was how much if you're visiting between farms, what should you change and change everything new clothing, new shoes and if possible, don't go to 2 farms on the same day. Um, Wash your car between farm yep. business. You just can't be clean enough. And, and um, we here at, at WSDA try not to go to more than uh, one farm of one species in a day. And it gives us plenty of time to clean and disinfect our clothing and our shoes and our vehicles and our equipment um, before we do that again. And I, I like to not go between exposure to birds more than once a week. That's what I try to do. Uh, so if you're going farm to farm, that's that's a pretty big risk. So definitely clean and disinfect, uh, change clothing, uh, and think about where your feet go, where your hands go, because that can all be contaminated. Just think, think, think all the time about 
having something bad on on your body that you can be spreading to the next farm. Be it's a good place for paranoia, and, <laughs> and you can never be too clean. Um. Excellent. A specific topic that was mentioned uh, by Catherine was Merrick's disease. Catherine, I would agree with you. Merrick's disease is quite um, a painful disease for a flock to experience, and definitely more information is always helpful from that perspective. All right, Dr. Carrier or Dr. Dobbs or Carla, did you catch any other questions I might have accidentally skipped over? I think they were uh, mostly people saying that, yes, they would like to see more webinars. Uh, they seem to ap appreciate this one. And we are about 15 minutes over our <laughs> hour that we had allotted, which is it's great. We've had a lot of good questions, but I think I'm going to cut it off now so we can wrap up. And uh, but I do want to. Uh, mention that email once again, if you have additional questions that we haven't answered yet, you can always. Um, email us at AV health, like avian health, AV health at agr.wa.gov, and we'll be able to help you out. Or if you um, missed Dr. Chen's email and you want to contact her, you can always send that to us and we can get it over uh, to her as well. So thank you so much for participating today. Again, we'll post this on our YouTube page, which is youtube.com slash WSDAGOV. So WSDA gov, and that will probably be up by tomorrow. So you feel free to watch it again or share it with others. Um, we appreciate you helping us get the word out and we can have some excellent biosecurity here, protecting both our flocks and our friends. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Good night.